What's up, guys? Cheers, and welcome to Uncle Scott's Pancast Podcast. <laughs> Got a lot going on in the old Pancast today. We're going to talk about this guy. This is a brand new Timbo Tusk Scottle Grill. If you've never heard of a Scottle Grill, I had never heard of one until a couple weeks ago. We're going to go through what one of these is and show you a little bit about how that cooks today. We're going to talk a little bit about steaks. And as Shakespeare once asked, sous vide or not sous vide? That is the question. We've got some viewer mail. We have got some discussion of soup labels, still talking about soup labels and whether there are too many choices in the market today. But what I want to start out with first is commenting on an article from the Washington Post. In its headline, if I can find it. EPA warns toxic forever chemicals more dangerous than once thought. Toxic forever chemicals. These are PFOAs, PFAS, excuse me. And if you go through the article, it says that, if I can find it. So we're going to PFOA and PFOS, and it says that these can possibly cause infertility, thyroid problems, and possibly several types of can cancer, and they persist in the environment for years and years without breaking down. Then it goes on to say, since the 1940s, quoting, chemical makers have used the highly durable compounds to make Non-stick cookware. Oh Lord, more non-stick skillets. If these toxic chemicals are getting out of non-stick skillets and into the groundwater where they can be detected, just think of what is in your scrambled eggs in the morning. Good Lord. So I implore everyone, as always, get rid of those non-stick skillets. I despise them get a carbon steel, a cast iron, or a good stainless steel, learn how to cook an egg, and don't kill the rest of us. <laughs> Do not like those non-stick skillets. But anyway, if you need any more reason to get rid of yours and learn to cook an egg, the EPA will tell you all about that. Let's see, last pan cast. I did that from the Jersey Shore. In New Jersey, uh, obviously, and people were asking, several people wrote in and asked where I was on the Jersey Shore. We were near Point Pleasant, if you're familiar with the Jersey Shore. That was my first time there. I actually stayed in a house several miles south of there on, uh, I guess it's State Road 35, but then went up to Point Pleasant, went to Jenkinson's Boardwalk, nice place to go, and I spent about $500 winning $3 worth of plush toys on the crane games there. And along those lines, Shoefly wrote in. He says he lives on Long Island and thought he felt a tremor in the force when I landed in New Jersey. Actually, that was probably not me. That tremor in the force was probably my wife. After five hours of coach seats with me and my four-year-old son, she turns into a Sith. <laughs> Sith Lord. We've been talking about soup labels recently. These Campbell's cream of mushroom soups, and you got the different colors and the different varieties. And the question out here, is that too much choice? Does that bother consumers? Have too many choices, or is it better to just have one? Well, I read an article in, from the um, American Psychological or Psychiatric Association talking about too much choice, and they quote a paper in the Journal of Consumer Research, I'll put, an art, I'll put a link to this article below, and someone named Chernev said he found that when people were offered variants of the same brand of toothpaste, talking about toothpaste here, for example, cavity prevention, tartar control, and teeth whitening types, for instance, quote, they tended to switch to another brand that offered a single option. So I still go back to these Campbell soup labels. Are there too many? Are there too many varieties of this cream of mushroom soup? And it is for some of their other soups as well. Does that turn people off? Did they go over and just buy the Progresso? 
maybe there's only one Progresso or another suit brand. And you get too confused by too many choices. In Sam's Club the other day on the soup aisle, and look at this. If you want cream of mushroom soup, Campbell's cream of mushroom soup at Sam's, here is your one choice. And you get it in a tin can pack. Makes it a lot easier to decide. I think so. I think too much choice. It sounds good on paper. It sounds good in boardrooms and in marketing departments. In the real world, I think too much choice causes confusion. Just me. What do you guys think? Now let's take a look at this Scottle Grill. Now, I want to give a shout out here to another YouTube channel called Trail Recon. If you guys have not seen that, that uh, channel, it's definitely worth checking out. My father started watching that and he got my little son, so the grandfather got the son interested in Trail Recon. And essentially, in a nutshell, what it is, it's a bunch of guys that have really fixed up, decked out four-wheel drive vehicles, Jeeps, Broncos, some Toyotas, some uh, Dodges, on and on. But what they do is go out and have these overland adventures. They've got all this high-end camping gear, these rooftop tents, totally decked out systems in their Jeeps. they get got refrigerators, little, little kitchen setups and they go out and they do these four-wheel drive roads out in the middle of nowhere. Beautiful scenery, but one thing they do in all the videos is stop and cook a nice meal. And they use, many of them use what are called scottle grills. Now my, my dad got my son watching this thing and every morning my son wakes up and he wants to play Trail Recon now. And he, when he goes down to breakfast, his plate is his scottle grill. And what we did was, I noticed some of those videos were shot here in Utah, uh, less than an hour's drive away. We, we can easily get up into the mountains from here. And so I, I loaded up, we've got a four wheel drive and we loaded up the, the Toyota FJ Cruiser, went and did our own little version, a trail recon, went up in the mountains, did some four wheel drive roads, stopped and cooked our lunch on my old Coleman stove. And then a couple of weeks later, he got near Father's Day and all of a sudden a box showed up and my wife had gotten me one of these Scottle grills like they use on Trail Recon. I want to show it to you guys. It's kind of neat. And these things originated apparently in South Africa. I had never seen one before. Actually when I saw it on the uh, show I had to look it up and figure out what it is. But what it is, is essentially a shallow steel, essentially a wide shallow walk. And what you do, I guess over in South Africa, these originated from uh, plow discs. They turned them into cooking griddles. And what you do is, is this one comes with kind of a backpacking stove that is mounted in this bracket. It has a bracket, it mounts underneath, and you can hook up these portable uh, disposable propane canisters, and it's got legs in here, and it's on its own stand. And then, whoo, I can see the heat coming out. Turn that burner on, and it's like a wide, shallow walk. And the first time I used it, I got to say it was kind of like what my wife said after our first date. Not terribly impressed. I, I set it up this past weekend. We went camping at Bear Lake, Utah. But three nights up there, we went over Logan Pass, up Logan Canyon, over the pass, down into Bear Lake. It was actually on June 20th, snowing on that pass. The day before summer in Utah, it was snowing. And then we had a couple of days of nice weather down at Bear Lake, did some... My wife did some stand-up paddle boarding, but I cooked on the Scottle Grill. First time I tried it, I just cooked up. I thought it'd go easy with some hot dogs and some uh, chicken sausages. And I was getting some weird cooking there. I was really having to learn the Scottle. And the hot dogs obviously are round and they don't make a lot of surface contact. So I felt like they were burning just a little bit. So I wasn't terribly impressed the first time I used it. The next night though, I got back in there and I cook some uh, chicken fajitas. And what I've noticed about the scottle is that the burner 
it heats up an area about eight inches wide, I would say. And so you get a really hot area right in the middle of the scottle, and then it's kind of a gradient on out towards the edges. And when I put that chicken in there for the chicken fajitas, I put some oil in the middle and put that chicken in there, and it made a lot better contact, and it actually cooked up really, really nicely. So I started to kind of get into the scottle a little bit. I uh, got the peppers on there, and the same thing, if you have some oil or some liquid in the middle of the, of the scottle, it tends to cook really nicely where there's nice, good contact there in the middle. And then when things are done, you can kind of scoot them off to the side. A little bit cooler out there, keeps them warm, but doesn't really continue the cooking. And it's really like a wide, shallow wok. Now, I did make one mistake with it. I uh, heated it up too fast and kind of burned some of the seasoning off in, in the middle of the scottle. And you can see this is a seasoned, I don't know if it's carbon steel or what kind of steel it is, but it's definitely seasoned. I burned a little seasoning off in the middle, but just like re-seasoning a carbon steel skillet, I got a paper towel and some oil and rubbed that spot down in the middle and it darkened right back in and re-seasoned right back up. So I'm still getting used to the scottle. It's not really a review, but thanks to my, my wife for giving me this thing and it's pretty darn neat. I had never seen one of these before. And I'm kind of getting into it. Pretty fun. All right, let's talk about steaks. I've been talking a lot about grilling here. It's summer outdoor grilling season. And there's some debate around here on the best way to cook a steak. Uh, I got some email from people asking me to check out sous vide. And this may be controversial, but I got to say, I do not care about sous vide. I have no interest in it whatsoever. Believe it or not, am I an old fuddy-duddy? Probably. <laughs> Yet I have several problems with sous vide that make me don't even want to try it out. Now let's take a look at the way I like to cook my steaks. I like to cook mine on the stovetop and preferably one of my really thick, heavy carbon steels. If I don't use one of those, I use a cast iron or sometimes even a good stainless steel. I get the pan up to five, 600 degrees and I take a nice, beautiful piece of meat like this, wait a couple minutes prep time, salt and pepper that thing, a little oil in the pan, and it goes. It goes from beautiful here to beautiful here. And it usually takes me about two minutes to heat the pan, a minute and a half to two minutes searing it on that first side, a minute and a half or so on that second side, and then I finish them in a 400 degree or so oven. And I use a thermometer, and I get that middle temperature up to exactly, precisely the way I like it. I take those out of the oven at 126, 127, and let them rest for five minutes or so, and that temperature comes up to 132, 133. Now, everybody has their own preferences, the way they like their steaks done, but to me, this is absolute perfection. With a glass of nice red wine and a Caesar salad, and sometimes a side. That is one of my favorite meals, if not my top meal in the entire world. But what I want to say is that is absolute perfection in my mind. And start to finish, the entire process is about nine minutes of actually doing something and four or five minutes of resting. So 13, 14, 15 minutes, I am done and the steak is perfect. Now let's compare and contrast that with sous vide. One thing I want to say about sous vide, it seems gross. I just cannot mentally take a nice beautiful piece of meat like this it looks absolutely delicious and put it in a bag and cook it in water it just seems disgusting so it reminds me a little bit of Thanksgiving a few years ago we got a big big turkey and uh, brined that thing and it was in, in the refrigerator soaking in there in a bag and I go to the fridge for a piece of fruit, actually probably a piece of cheese. Open the door and there is a disgusting dead bird soaking in my fridge. It was awful. The final turkey was nice, it tasted good, but it was disgusting up until that point. It's kind of the same way with this sous vide, at least to me. You take a nice beautiful piece of meat like this and you put it in a plastic bag and put it in water. It just mentally, it may turn out great, Mentally, I just cannot process that. It's disgusting to me. Further, 
Cooking in plastic. Um, I'm not sure you're supposed to heat things in plastic. Now they may have some special bags for the sous vide that are hot water safe. But I know some people, I've seen some videos, I looked at the America's Test Kitchen and the Serious Eats, their sous vide steak videos. And they were talking about doing this in Ziploc bags. I am not sure you're supposed to get Ziploc bags, you know, hot and cook in those things. We talked about the microplastics and all that stuff earlier. I don't think you're supposed to do that. So I don't know. I don't want to cook anything too hot in a plastic bag. Then I also see you've got the sous vide machine. You've got a big tub of water. And then some people were using a vacuum sealer to seal up those steaks before they put them in the water. So you've got two more pieces of equipment, a big vat of water you've got to clean up. You're cooking in plastic. And then they show these steaks after they've been in that water for an hour and a half, two hours. They take them out and they just look like hell. I mean, they just look awful. They're kind of a disgusting pale gray. And they sit there and let them rest for a while. I don't know if I would want to sit there and look at a disgusting pale gray steak for 15 minutes, even though I'm going to cook it and brown it up. It looks pretty disgusting. That goes into the way you think about your food. And then at the end, you still have to heat up a pan and brown it on both sides anyway. Now, they say that it solves the gradient problem. So if you slice one of the steaks, they say you get consistent color from edge to edge, consistent color and temperature. But to me, that was not a problem that needed to be solved. When I cook my, my steak in the hot pan and then go into the oven, my method, I get that sear on the outside. I really love that sear. And then it's maybe an eighth of an inch or so of kind of a little bit of well done strip around the edges. It gives it a little chew. And then I like a reddish pink, soft, cooler, uh, delicious, buttery center in the middle. So in every bite of my steak, I get the sear. I get a little bit of chew and texture from that little bit of well done strip. And then I get that buttery, soft, warm interior. I think it's much more delicious. The gradient problem, I actually like the gradient. I got to say that uh, edge to edge color doesn't seem right. And I don't really want that. So hate to be a Debbie Downer on sous vide, but I am just not interested in the slightest. Now, I understand if you own a restaurant or you're in the food service area and you have people walking through the door, you don't know what they're going to order. And you got to keep some steaks ready to go so you can cook them quickly. That's fine. I understand that. But at home, sous vide does not interest me in the slightest. What do you guys think? I don't know. All right, that wraps her up for this pancast. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time.